praise the Lord. Good morning. Can you all hear me? I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. If you only knew the week that I had. Father went into surgery on Tuesday to remove a four inch aneurysm. Surgery lasted about 90 to 100 minutes longer than it should have. But, but thank God he is the great physician. That this isn't testimony service, but you don't know the week that I had. He, he was ready to die just a few hours before he went into to pre-op. He said, Joe, he said, I've lived a good life. He said, if this is it, he said, I'm happy. I was more worried than he was. But I thank God that God is a healing God. I, I'm, I'm so glad. I don't, I don't know about you. 47 years old. I'm thankful for the Majeur family from coming all the way from Michigan. Did you drive or did you fly? Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for traveling mercy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we've come with so many burdens. Some you've lifted, some are still resting heavy upon us. Father, we ask that as we open your word, that you will indeed open our hearts. We know that you've already opened our hearts through the worship and through the greeting and through prayer, but Father, we ask that you increase our capacity for your son, Jesus. That is our only wish. In his glorious and matchless name, we ask these blessings. Amen. When I rejoiced on Monday, in the men's national championship winner of 2010, the Duke Blue Devils, I, I was praising the Lord because it wasn't even the most talented team that won. They beat a small university called Butler University. And I've, seen, I've been to Butler University. It's there in Indianapolis. They say it, won as the, it was one of the best games of all time, but, but thank God the, the Blue Devils won. But e even more fascinating than, than the Blue Devils' rise was that of, of their counterpart, the Yukon Huskies. The Yukon team is so good that they haven't lost a game in over two years. You, you know you bad when you, when, you, when you haven't lost a game in two years. But on Tuesday night, the battle was more than they bargained for. The halftime score looked something like an NFL score. Stanford 20, Yukon 12. It was the worst half of Yukon basketball this decade. This decade, they shot five of 29 from the field. But they're used to being in impossible situations. Check this. In their practice, they have male practice players. And to prepare them for impossible situations, their coach, Gina or or Oriema, he has them practicing full court presses five on seven. If you've ever played basketball before, the full court press is the hardest thing to break. The idea is to make the game situation capable of being handled. And the Huskies responded at the start of the second half with a 17-2 run. What people don't know is that Gino Oriema, he actually sits for the last six months. He has sat with the legendary John Woodens from UCLA. He actually carries John Woodens playbook around. He is prepared literally for any situation. No matter the pressure, the coach keeps his players committed to the program. He is the best coach with the best team and he even has the best playbook. And when moments get tight, the players, they just do what they've been doing all year. Part of the beauty of the 78 game winning streak is their robotic-like consistency. Even their pregame ritual, it doesn't change based upon the context. In San Antonio, when the stakes are high and when the pressure was on, they didn't change anything they did. They had their usual breakfast, scrambled eggs and bacon and French toast, and they had their usual pregame dinner of 
grilled chicken and pasta and a baked potato. They arrived at the arena 90 minutes before the tip-off, as they always do. And when they faced the toughest moment of the season, they channeled their consistency when the pressure hit. Their coach says, we act the way champions are supposed to act. The concluding remark from Maya Moore, the junior forward, she says, we just had to keep on playing hard and executing what we did not execute in the first half. Sometimes it's just that simple. You have to focus on the little things that you've been working on all year, and then things start clicking. They have confidence in the playbook. They have confidence in their coach. They have confidence in their program. And when things got tight, they trusted the strategy of their coach. Beloved, I believe the same thing is true in our spiritual walk. We have a greater coach. We have a greater playbook. And we have a greater tradition. And we succeed when we trust our coach and follow his playbook. We're going we're gonna to see how in this message is entitled, Trust the Game Plan. Very simple, trust the game plan. Our scripture reading is from Philippians 4, Philippians 4, verses 4 to 9, Philippians 4, Philippians 4, it's on the screen. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible, Philippians 4. The Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Uh, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, some translations say, and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think on these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, what does he say? Put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I heard one preacher say that seven days without God makes one week. Seven days without God makes one week. Sunday becomes sin day. Monday becomes mourn day. Tuesday becomes tears day. Wednesday becomes waste day. Thursday becomes thirst day. Friday becomes fight day. And Saturday becomes shattered day. Seven days without practice, without executing God's game plan, it makes you weaker than you first began in the week. And nobody knows this better than the 2007-2008 MVP of the National Basketball Association, Kobe Bryant. February 7th of 2010, just about a month ago, the Los Angeles Lakers were playing the Orlando Magic. It was more than just a rematch of last year's finals. It was a battle between two teams, but it was also a battle inside of a battle. Matt Barnes against Kobe Bryant. For some reason, Matt Barnes decided to see how close he could come to getting thrown out the game without actually getting tossed. And he did everything that he possibly could have to irritate Kobe, getting physical with him. He even faked an inbounds pass into Kobe's face just to get him to flinch. But, but Kobe didn't budge. He tried to bait him into a technical. The striking thing to me is that Mar Mar Matt Barnes, he didn't understand how intelligent and how calculating Kobe is. He's not going to respond to being baited no matter how many times you try to bait him. Barnes, he, he made a point of bumping Kobe every chance he got, taunting him at times, and flat out trying to run him over when the, when the, when the officials wasn't looking. Each time, Kobe just raised his hands to make sure the nearby officials saw that he wasn't initiating anything and he wasn't responding. Barnes, he says, I I've been getting calls from friends telling me that this whole, that this whole West Coast is mad at me. He said, it's kind of funny. It, he said it was a good throwback game. If you saw the game, it wasn't a good throwback game. He said it was a good throwback game. He said, I grew up watching the Lakers play in Detroit, playing Boston and the old New York Knicks. It was just one of those games with a lot of physical play. Kobe, he didn't shoot the ball particularly well. He shot 12 of 30 from the field, even though he had 34 points and seven rebounds and seven assists and three steals. 
Barnes, he wasn't willing to take credit for Kobe's sh shooting because Barnes says there's no such thing as a Kobe stopper. He says when he has an off night, it's because of what he is doing. Not anything that I am doing. He says there's no such thing as a Kobe stopper or a Kobe killer or a Kobe anything. Barnes says he's the best player in the world. He's the best player on the planet. And sometimes you just got to make him work for what he gets. You're not really going to stop those kind of guys. He says you can't get in their heads. Those guys are so tuned into the game. Then he, he says, I really, I didn't believe him. He says, I wasn't trying to get in his head. I was just trying to go out there and match his intensity. That's all Barnes did on Sunday. He couldn't stop Kobe. He could only hope to contain him. He just slowed him down just a little bit. All of his other antics that he did to Kobe went largely unnoticed. Because Kobe is focused. Barnes was wise enough to downplay his role in Kobe's subpar shooting night because it's likely that these two teams are going to meet again in the, in the NBA Finals. And Kobe, like Michael Jordan, has a long memory. If Barnes was to go around calling himself a Kobe stopper, he would find himself on the wrong end of another offensive explosion by Kobe Bryant. Just ask Reuben Patterson of the, of the Trailblazers. Barnes, you try to get into Kobe's head. If you do that, you're playing with fire. Even though the Lakers lost the game at the buzzer, Kobe missed the last shot attempt. Kobe knows what all the UConn Husky players know. I got the best coach in Phil Jackson. I got the best team in the Los Angeles Lakers. And I got the best playbook. Therefore, I can be the best. But I got to trust in the game plan. Kobe got the secret and Paul also got it. Paul said, I trust in the Father's game plan. Again, he says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, will, which, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, if you trust in God's game plan, when situations get tight, when the enemy tries to get in your head, all you got to do is trust in the Father's game plan. It's like when the devil came to Jesus in the wilderness, trying to get into his head the way Barnes tried to get into Kobe's head, trying to make Jesus lose his cool and doubt his divinity. Jesus said, you can't, you can't get in my head because I trust in the Father's game plan. Jesus knew God's playbook so well, he memorized it, he didn't need it in front of him because Jesus trusted the Father's game plan. He didn't deviate from the Father's strategy when things got tight. Jesus had the mind of God. Paul is saying trust in the game plan because our coach has already worked this thing out. The father kept the mind of Jesus because Jesus took time to memorize the game plan and he took time to spend with his heavenly father. God says I will keep him in perfect peace if his mind is stayed upon me. Simply put, Verses 6 and 7 of our scripture talks about how, how prayer keeps our minds. What did I say? Prayer keeps our minds. Verses 8 and 9 explains to us how God's word changes our minds. We're going to look at verses 8 and 9, and then we're going to go to verses 4 through 7. Verses 8 and 9 shows us the power of God's playbook. It says, again, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You know, we, we quote this passage a lot to, to try to control what people listen to and, and what people watch and what people read. But what we cannot do is disconnect verses 8 and 9 from prayer. Before you can think heavenly thoughts, you have to be first connected to the heavenly father. We, prayer changes the mind and prepares the mind for change. We cannot disconnect God's word from prayer. But, but while we're talking about prayer in the playbook, Jesus was telling Satan, I, I trust in the game plan. Paul is telling the church and Paul is telling us, 
that you can trust the game plan because it worked for me. How do you know it worked, Paul? Is it just something that you're saying? Is it something that you're just quoting to get me to change my behavior so you can control what I watch and what I think? No, 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 no. Paul, Paul isn't talking about that. G, what Paul is saying, he's saying, I trust the Father's game plan because it worked for Jesus. Jesus was the first ever player coach. Jesus trusted the Father's game plan. When the pressure began to break on Jesus, Jesus didn't lose his cool. His disciples packed it in when they were down at the half. When the full, when the full court press came, the disciples abandoned Jesus and they fell asleep. They deserted him and betrayed him. But Easter is Easter because Jesus trusted in the game plan. Jesus says, creation trusts the creator. Jesus said, nature trusts in the game plan. Nature doesn't try to grow. Nature just grows. It doesn't try harder to grow. It doesn't use willpower to grow. Creation trusts the creator. What, what are you talking about, preacher? Matthew 6, 28 to to 34. The Bible says, why, why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They don't labor, they don't spin. Yeah. Therefore, you can trust God. He goes on to say, don't, don't worry saying, what, what, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? For the pagans wonder after such things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them before you even ask him. Jesus said, put my game plan first. Put my playbook first. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these other things. The MVP, all of these other things, the scoring title, all of these other things will be added onto you. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry what you cannot fix, what you cannot control. For tomorrow is, going to, tomorrow is going to worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We can trust God because creation trusts God. When I think about this and our scripture reading about thinking holy thoughts, that, that, that lets me know that only God can change me. If, if, if grass and, and trees and leaves, if they can't make themselves grow and change and transform, neither can I. I got to trust the creator. By looking at creation, we, we see how we can think holy thoughts. Let, let, let's, let's make it plain. All, all, all of you scientists, all, all, of, you, all of you scientists, I, 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 I dropped out of school when I was studying biology. And when, when I first looked at this, I didn't understand it. But, but the third and fourth and fifth and about eighth time I looked at it, I began to shout, photosynthesis, photosynthesis. It, it, I think it's the process that Jesus is talking about. How many of you know what photosynthesis is? Praise the Lord. Your, your, your dollars are, are, are doing good. <laughs> I went to public school. We, we <laughs> Photosynthesis. It's a natural process that plants go through to grow and to give us oxygen. How many of you know the rainforest provides most of the world's oxygen? Trees give us oxygen. Plants don't have to force this process. They basically, they take sunlight from above. And they take water from the soil. When light touches the surface of the plant, when it's in the presence of chloroform, that, that's what makes the, the plant green. Because green is the only light of the spectrum that, that the leaf will absorb, chloroform. When light touches the surface of the plant, an endothermic reaction takes place. It takes an electron called the primary acceptor. And it makes it jump to another energy level. And when the electron comes down, it releases energy and creates what is needed to complete the process to turn carbon dioxide into carbohydrates. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? I, I, I'm not in college yet. I, I, don't, I, don't care about, I don't care about plants and all that stuff. Well, what are you talking about? When you take in the light of God's word, the Holy Ghost grabs what you read, it's not just the word alone. It's not just light alone. The Holy Ghost takes that word and a reaction takes place in your heart. He takes all of the negative things in your life and he gives you positive things. When oxygen combines with, with carbon dioxide, sugar and energy is stored in the cell of the leaf. 
When you take in God's word, you get energy. You can't think holy and noble and pure thoughts without the word of God. It's, it's, not, it's not a science lecture. But when light touches the surface, it just, just jumps up. And when it comes down, it releases energy. When, when I saw that, I, I turned that into a poem and I passed my, my first biology lecture. I passed my first biology exam. Because when I looked at that, I saw that's how God transforms me. When I take in God's word, all plants can do is turn towards the sun and receive the light. It, it, it's a process that happens. They can't control it. They can't create it. They just take in the light and they grow. Photosynthesis teaches us the importance of God's word. I'm not going to tell you how to receive the light. Some people got to read the Bible. You know, some people got to read certain versions of the Bible. At certain times of the day, me, I read many different I take in the light many different ways. Sometimes it's, it's in the Word. Sometimes it's on my computer. Sometimes it's in my car. And sometimes it's on my iPod. Whatever you need to do, you need to take in the light. That's how you take in the playbook. Take in the light. Creation, trust the Creator, and thrives because of it. It's not a process you can control. When you take in the light, you just grow. What are, you, what are you talking about? What, what are you talking about? Jesus says a parable in Mark 4. He says in Mark 4, 26 to 29, he says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. He said, I'm going to break it down for you. He says, it's like a man scatters seed. You think you've been reading all that scripture and, and it just, it's, you just lose it all. You, you don't know where it went. It's just scattering everywhere. Scattering seed on the ground. Jesus said night and day. Jesus said night and day. Praise the Lord, somebody. Whether he sleeps or gets up, what did Jesus say? The seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk and then the head and then a full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts in a sickle because the harvest has come. When situations get tight, all that light you've been taking in, it's going to come forth when you need it. You can't control that Jesus said the Holy Ghost is going to take what I've given you and bring it back to your mind. You think you need to have an IQ to trust in the Father's game plan. No, no, no. All you need is receptive soil and creative ways in which to receive the light. That's how you think holy thoughts. Thank God for the word. You, you can't execute the game plan without knowing the playbook. When the defense get tight, quote the playbook. When, the, when those rap lyrics come back to your mind, quote the playbook. When you get those phone calls in the middle of the night, quote the playbook. When the devil tries to get all up in your space, tell him I've hidden God's word in my heart, and he's going to bring to my mind the things that I've stored there. You see, <laughs> plants take in light. So they can store sugar, which is energy, glucose, for two reasons. To release energy into the atmosphere, take things that are poison and give us things that are beneficial. But you know what else? <laughs> Plants store energy during the daytime. Because <laughs> plants know that, that when night comes, it, there's there's going to be no light in the atmosphere, and it's going to be cold and dark. Plants store energy during the daytime when light is plentiful. Because when the night comes and when the temperature drops, light will not be available. The Krebs cycle and the proton pump testifies of the power of God. That's explaining plants when all we got to do is take in light when it's available. Don't you know there's going to be a time? I got about, I think I got about 40 Bibles. I got about 40 hard copy Bibles and maybe 100 in electronic form. They're, they're, you can't be, you're not going to be able to haul all that stuff up those mountains. This, this laptop is going is to be useless. I'm not going to have my Palm Pilot or an app with God's Word on the iPhone. It's going to have to be in my heart because when it gets dark and when the temperature drops, I got to have that playbook on the inside. Though, see, if you report to training camp and don't know the playbook, don't you know you get dropped in the depth chart? 
when the time comes, the Holy Ghost has to take that playbook and not just make it something up here. It has to be visceral. Jesus didn't, he wasn't carrying around scrolls. Jesus knew the power of the word. It's light and water. It's the word and the spirit. It's not just memorizing scripture for scripture's sake. Creation trusts the creator. Therefore, Paul reasons if creation can trust the creator, the redeemed can trust in the redeemer. If it works for Kobe, who, who just signed, you know, a $90 million extension. If it works for nature, and if it works for Paul, Paul said, since it works for me, maybe it's the possibility it can work for you. He says in verse 9, whatever you've learned or received or seen in me, put into practice. You see, one of the, one of the great things about Michael Jordan and, and Kobe, finally, is that they make other people great. Paul says, since you've seen it in me, since it's working for me, you can do it. I'm not just telling you what to do. I'm telling you how to do it. Paul, are you telling me that praying and reading God's word can take me through any time? You see, there, there are levels to the spiritual walk. There's this scripture it, it is, is a prescription for anxiety. And it shows us how to have what Robert Mulholland calls mature faith. We see, we have stress and anxiety in our lives. But, it, but this passage shows us how to have mature faith. We have, we, see, when you have stress, when you have anxiety, it's because, one, you don't have the playbook on the inside of you, and because you're not in conversation with the coach. Philippians provides the remedy for stress and, and all of the foolishness. First, first, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. What, what? He said, just so you missed it, he says, I, I'll say it again, re rejoice. It, it's a command. What? What are you talking about, Paul? Why are you saying rejoice? Paul is saying you're, you're, you're giving God thanks not for all things, but in all things. It's not always telling God about your problems, but it, it's telling your problems about your God. When, when my father gave me the news that he had an a, a aneurysm the size of a golf ball, there was a part of me. That cried. I, I just couldn't concentrate. I had to take a couple days off of work. I, I, I don't, my, my temperament, I don't like bad news. I don't have the gift of faith. Uh-oh. So, so when crises comes my way, even though I'm intelligent, even though I'm spiritual and all that, I had, I had to look at how, how big my problem was. And I looked at the size of my problem. Seven doctors and ten tests. No insurance. You got to be in the hospital for eight days. You got to be on bed rest for 90 days before you can even start rehab with no job and no insurance. When I looked at the bigness of my problem, it wasn't even mine. The Bible says rejoice. You know, you, you, you're liable to read something like that and take God's word and throw it up against the wall. How are you going to tell me to rejoice when I'm hurting? How do I do that? You're telling me to quote and claim God's promises, just claim it and name it, and then you frame it and all this other stuff. How do you do that? It's emphasizing the greatness of your God while knowing the bigness of your problem. It's not denying stuff. This isn't fatalism. Then he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. He said, the Lord is near. Let's, let my gentleness. I'm not, I'm a man. I'm not gentle. See, see, Paul is saying, be gentle when people don't expect you to be gentle. Be patient when people expect you to be irritable. This is not cussing your boss out just because he's telling you to do your job. You're on Facebook and you're on MySpace and you're on Twitter. When your boss comes to you and says, please do your job, be gentle for the Lord is near. <laughs> see, this is a nine to five thing. This is, this is a real life thing. You see, the alternative to anxiety is mature faith. See, when you, when you trust in the game plan, there is a decrease in anxiety and an increase in peace. Paul, Paul said, don't be anxious about anything. <laughs> Paul, you're making this thing hard. Don't be anxious about anything. 
you, you trying to plan stuff and your spiritual gift is an administration. Be anxious about nothing. When we experience anxiety, it shows the evidence of our lack of trust in God. You know, when it's when you wake up late, your family's already in the kitchen. You know you're 30 minutes late and you're, you're not going to get you're not going to get rush hour it's when you walk into a room looking for something and you can't find it you're anxious and then you get mad at other people showing your irritability because the Lord isn't your shepherd God hasn't taken you beside those still streams God hasn't restored your soul therefore you're irritable so when you get to work Help us, Holy Ghost. And you put coffee in your system. You're even more irritable. You come to lunch angry at everybody. Your, your productivity goes down. And then when 2.30 comes, you got to take those five-hour energy drinks. And then you get home late. And then you, the first thing you do is you, is you uh oh, you go in the kitchen and you put on dinner and you turn on the TV and the children come home. And all of this anxiety builds up. Paul said, the, the, the remedy for that is don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer. Paul is saying, in everything, every situation in your life is a call to pray, whether big or small. Prayer is having the attitude of being available to God and listening to God in all times and in all places. He says, by prayer and petition, or prayer and supplication, that's the attitude of being open and receptive. That's being humble. That's knowing that there's somebody else that can take care of my problems. There's somebody else who's greater than I and who's bigger than I and who has greater resources than I, who I am in communication with, and I'm just handing it all over to him. Then he says, with thanksgiving. Paul, Paul you, you, you're hurting me. This is having an attitude of gratitude. This means you're not thinking of your problems as yours alone. You're not the only person to have an irritable boss. You're, you're not the only person that rides on E and you're stuck in rush hour. And you know if you stop to get gas, you're going to be 15 minutes late. And that's going to go in your evaluation. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. After you do all of that. Then, then Paul says, then <laughs> present your request to God. Prayers now have the correct context. Then he says, and the peace of God, the irene of God, which transcends all understanding. If you could understand it with psychology and self-help books, it wouldn't be the peace of God. It transcends all understanding. See, mature faith leads to peace. This comes from being in the playbook and talking with the coach. People will know more about God when you are supposed to be anxious. When your reaction is a reaction of peace instead of one of irritability. People need to see God in the midst of darkness. People need to see God with skin on it. People need to know that at least you believe that God either will come through or at least think he can come through. When people see you on an everyday basis having a decrease in anxiety and an increase in peace, then they don't have to go to Oprah and then they don't, they don't have to go down to the McKenzie Arena and see Joyce Meyer tonight. <laughs> you, you don't have to buy all these $29.99 books. When the, the peace of God, it transcends all understanding. Then, then Paul says it will guard your hearts, and your minds in Christ Jesus. This, this, see, this thing is real. See, the peace of God will guard your heart. That, that's, that's, your, that's your what we call the reptilian brain and the neo-mammalian brain, the, limp, the limbic system and the brain stem, the emotions and feelings, anxiety. The peace of God will keep your emotions and your feelings. Paul said it doesn't just keep your lower brain. It keeps your higher, your cerebral cortex. It guards your mind. This, you're talking about thinking the thoughts of God. You, if, when you do all of that, God says, I will keep 
your emotions and your thoughts when you cannot keep them yourself. When you have a, what we call a scatterbrain, it might just be your personality to go this way and to go that way. When you hide God's word in your heart, combined with God's spirit, you will have increased concentration. Your grades will go up. Then you can master calculus when you, when you didn't have the books because you went to public school. You can thrive in a situation when ordinarily you don't have the tools to thrive. The peace of God transcends all understanding. Paul, Paul says, I trust the game plan because Jesus trusted the Father's game plan. This, he's, Paul said, this thing is real. You see, we, we can talk about Kobe, and you can talk about plants, and you can talk about all these people in the Bible, but it don't mean nothing unless people can see it in you. Paul, Paul, said, Paul said, this thing worked for me. Paul did it really? I, 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 don't, I don't believe you. Maybe, maybe this thing is just a reality show. This, this thing isn't real. Where, where are the strings at, Paul? Paul said, okay. I, I, I got you. Paul, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27, he says, I've, I've worked much harder. He said, I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. He says, five times I've received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Paul says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. He said, I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Paul says, I've been constantly on the move. I commute to work. I'm, I'm a transient. I've been in danger from rivers. I've been in danger from bandits. I've been in danger from my own people. I've been in danger from the Gentiles. I've been in danger in the city. And I've been danger in the country. I've been danger at sea and danger from false brothers. Paul said, I've labored and I've toiled and I've often gone without sleep. Uh-oh. Paul says, I, I, I have insomnia. He says, I've known hunger and I've known thirst, and I've often gone without food. He says, I've been cold and I've been naked, but God brought me through it all. He says, when I was flogged, when I was beaten, when I was shipwrecked, Paul says, I trusted in the game plan. When I was lost, when I was hungry, when I couldn't sleep, I trusted in the game plan. Paul, Paul said, this, this, thing, this, this thing ain't fake, this thing ain't theoretical. Look at verse 28 and 29. Besides everything else, I've been through all that in the past. But he says, I face daily pressure for my concern for all of the churches. He says, who, who is weak? Don't I feel weak? Who is led into sin? Don't I inwardly burn? Paul is saying, I trust the game plan, not just based upon what God did in the past. Paul said, I trust in the Father's game plan every day. When I am pressured, when I am weak, when I feel like sinning, when my heart begins to beat fast, somebody, somebody know what I'm talking about, when my heart begins to wander, I trust in the game plan. Paul is saying, this thing is real. When I see the pornography come across the screen, when I see all the parties that my friends are trying to invite me to, when I go to the store and see all these flashy clothes that I know I can't afford, just because they're on MBT and and in BT and VH1, when I see all of that, I'm going to trust in the game plan. When my heart wants to go back, when I see the rap stars, and when I see all of their cars, knowing they're going to be bankrupt in about 10 years, when I see all of that, I'm still going to trust in the game plan. When I, when I try to slip, when they try to pull me down, I'm, I'm going to trust in the Father's game plan. If the game plan doesn't work in real life and in everyday situations, it's not worth having. Then it's just X's and O's. When I can't sleep. To all my men out there, when, when, when I can't sleep, when it's after midnight, when you're flipping through the channels instead of being on your knees, when that number flashes across the screen, promising what it cannot deliver, when the text messages come across your phone at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you see the name, you shouldn't even see the name, but when you see the name and your heart begins fluttering, when those spam emails come into your inbox, tell them I'm going to trust in the Father's game plan. When I'm prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. 
I'm prone to leave the God I love. God, here's my heart. Lord, take and seal it, seal it for, for, thy, cuts, for thy courts above. When it gets like that, you, you, you need a time out. Sometimes you just got to tell God, I, I, I need a time out. Tell the devil, I, 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 if Eve would have said, just wait a minute. I need a timeout. I, I need, the defense is too tight. I, I, get, I can't get past this press. I need a 30-second timeout. I, I need a break. I, I need to talk to the coach. I know the playbook, but, but this thing is bigger than what I, what I can handle. I need a timeout. I need to communicate with my coach. You know, Phil Jackson, he, he always tried to rein in Kobe. I mean, when, when Jerry West got him, I believe it was in 96 with the 13th pick, and, and they traded Vladi Divac and whoever that was to Charlotte. When, when Kobe first walked into the, it wasn't the Staples Center then, Phil Jackson always tried, always tried to rein him in because people with extraordinary gifts often take pride in their gifts. And, and, and when Shaq left, or was shipped out, whatever you want to call it. Kobe led the league in scoring, but, but they missed the playoff. Team. Kobe, would, he acted like he trusted in the game plan. You know, when, when they played the Phoenix Suns and they went up three to one when Kwame Brown finally was getting his, <laughs> he's finally getting his money's worth. When they went up three to one, Kobe acted like he trusted in the game plan. He was passing the ball and deferring to his teammates. But as soon as Rajah Bell clotheslined him, Kobe defaulted and he, and he dropped 50 and they lost in overtime. Kobe acted like he trusted the game plan. Kobe, you, you almost lose your wife because you didn't trust in the game plan. You, 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 you almost got traded to the Chicago Bulls because you didn't trust in the game plan. And then you come to, to Lakers versus Celtics in th 2007. Phil Jackson was begging Kobe to trust in the game plan. Why should Kobe trust in the game plan? Why? why? I, I'm already a millionaire. I've already had three championships. Why do I need to trust in the game plan other than Shaq? Why do I need to trust in the game plan? See, when you try to be the man and you know you can't win, you're really going to lose. And the Lakers lost against the Celtics, and they got beat up pretty bad. I think they could have won, but they got beat really bad because they didn't trust the game plan. And the Celtics were slightly better. Kobe, he was passing the ball, and he was being passive at times. He was acting like works righteousness. He was acting like he trusted the game plan. But when the situation got tight, he just reverted back to being a superhero. And so it was when a youngster came along after his face loss and Mark 7th rolls around and, and Morris Barnes tries to get into his head. It doesn't phase him because Kobe knows that I can only win. I'm great, I'm a millionaire, but I can only win when I trust in the game plan. And so here come Morris Barnes. Matt Barnes, and tries to get into Kobe's head, and it doesn't faze him because he trusts Phil Jackson. And what happened at the end of the game? Kobe, he, he missed a jumper, at, I believe it was at, at, at the, on the right side of the top of the key, and, and, and the magic won. He lost, and he trusted in the game plan, and he lost. The Lakers were defeated, and the NBA thought that they had one up. On, on, on the whole city of Los Angeles. Maybe we found a weakness. Kobe, you've trusted in the game plan, but you've lost. They lose on Sunday, but, but three days later, Kobe, he gets another shot. The same thing that happened about seven times before this season at the end of the game, Kobe got another chance three days later. Kobe knew if I trust in the game plan, there will come a point where my greatness will be displayed over my opponents. I lost against the Magic, but I still will trust in the game plan. And now I'm in the situation again. What am I going to do? Now we're down by one against the Toronto Raptors with 1.7 seconds to go. 
Kobe gets the ball at the top of the key. He goes right away from the help defense, and he pulls up a jumper at the right baseline. And the, and the ball goes in, and the Lakers win because Kobe trusted in the game plan. He was defeated three days before. He now experienced his victory because he trusts in the game plan. It seemed like he lost. But when he trusted the coach against Orlando and he loses, three days later, he trusts in the game plan and experiences victory. For all of you who who saying, what are you talking about, Joe? <laughs> For all of you who may not understand me, Jesus trusted in the game plan. But what the disciples didn't know is that the best player on the court had a pregame meeting with the owner of the team. This meeting was actually before the game was ever played, before the rules were ever made, and before players were ever involved. Jesus and the Father came up with a game plan that he would play in the game and be defeated. Even though he invented the game and he could play the game and he was better at the game than anyone who could ever play the game, there's no cheerleaders, there's no substitution, there's no six man. Jesus had no timeouts. Jesus had the ball at buzzer and the game plan said lose. But just like Kobe, thank you, Jesus, Jesus trusted in the game plan. <laughs> and three days later, <laughs> there was a rematch and the opponents were up by a point and they thought that Jesus was out for the season. They thought that he had a career ending, a career devastating accident, a life threatening injury. They thought that Jesus was out. And when they saw Jesus leave the court, they thought they were gonna win. But when the announcer Gabriel comes to the, to the announcing table, he announces that Jesus is at the scoring table. The opponents are going to try to stop him. They're going to try to cheat. They're going to try to take him out. But nothing could make Jesus lose this time. The announcer says, Jesus, thou son of David, thy father calleth thee. And Jesus, his divine consciousness, aroused life that was dead. And he jumped up and put on his uniform, and he got back in the game. And Jesus took the ball, and he hit the winning shot, and he says, I got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. I not only give the game plan, I am the game plan. Just give me the ball and get out the way. And you'll see how clutch I really am. Trust in my game plan. When you pray, when you read my word, you are saying, I trust in the game plan. When things get tight, just call a timeout and give me the ball. How many playbooks you know got one play? Give me the ball and get out the way. One play, whatever the difficulty, whatever the defense, give me the ball and get out the way. That's why Paul said, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We talked about photosynthesis. See, there, there, there's, a, there's a flip side to photosynthesis. Photosynthesis takes place in plant cells and also cellular respiration. Respiration not only takes place in plant cells, but also in mammal cells. You have many different types of respiration, anaerobic, aerobic, I passed biology, praise the Lord. I didn't excel in it. But, but respiration is the process. After photosynthesis has already taken place, where the body breathes in oxygen. And the oxygen goes to the lungs. And a reaction takes place on the cellular level in your mitochondria. You heard of mitochondria? And a reaction takes place. Sugar is connected to oxygen, and a reaction takes place. I'm not going to explain it. There's no need for all that. But your body gets energy when you breathe in oxygen. 
Have you noticed when you exercise and you're not breathing, your muscles get tired? That's lactic acid. That's in the absence of oxygen. A process of fermentation and all that's, that's alcohol. That stuff takes place. If you don't have oxygen in your body, alcohol, the alcohol, the pH level of your blood will increase. And you can die from something that's called acidosis. Your body needs oxygen. It's an involuntary process. All you got to do is breathe in oxygen. You do the small thing. And what you cannot see, what you cannot control, and half of us can't understand. The body, what do you breathe out? You breathe out carbon dioxide. You take in things that are positive, oxygen that your body needs. And you release all of the negative things in your body, carbon dioxide. Ellen White calls prayer the breath of the soul. When you breathe in the Holy Ghost, you do the small thing. You get on your knees every morning or whenever you do it. Tell God what you need. Tell God I'm weak. I, I, I've looked at the playbook. I don't really understand it. I see these X's and O's, but I, I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm going to do the small thing. I'm going to breathe in the breath of heaven. And God says, if you do that, I will do the big thing. I will do what your body does for you. I will take out all of the alcohol in your life, all of that negative stuff, all of that stress, and all of that anxiety. You do the small thing and let God do the big thing. That's what Paul is saying eventually. You do the small thing and let me do the big thing. Jesus has already carried the heaviness of sin. And the only thing you have to do is take in the light and breathe in the oxygen. And God says a supernatural process will take place in your life that you cannot explain, that you cannot control. But God says if you do that, you will have an increase in peace and you will have mature faith. There are those of you here under the sound of my voice, you want to do the small thing. You want to tell God, God, here's this thing. I, I can't deal with it. I'm going to give it to you. I want you to give me what I cannot get, what I cannot control, and what I cannot understand. And beloved, that's salvation. If you have anxiety or stress in your life, I work 50 some miles a week. I got stress in my life. If you have anxiety and stress in your life and you want to give it to God, I want you to stand to your feet and I'm going to pray for you. Trust in the game plan. There are some people here like Paul. You know, when Paul wrote this letter, he was in prison. He was in darkness. He was in chains. But he says, no matter my circumstance, I'm going to trust in the game plan. If there's someone here who, who's like Ron Artest, they just joined the team. And, and you need to trust in the game plan. It's, it's new to you. But you want to give it to God. I want you to come down to the front. I'm going to pray for you. This, this thing is new. And, and you want to tell God, I want to trust in your game plan. You, you may not have done it before. You may have never done it in your life. Or maybe you want to do it again. I want you to come to the altar. And I'm going to pray for you. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Still you want to say, Lord, take my burdens and right give me your peace. Me. Is there one? Praise the Lord. Nothing will Is there anyone I else? fear as long as you are near. Trust Please in the Father's game plan. Jesus lost so you can end. win. And because he won, we all win. If you want to be like Ron Artest, he was a free agent and he joined a winning team. He didn't even create the title. He didn't know nothing about it, but he just joined the team. If you want to join God's team, I want you to come to the front and I'm going to pray. Is there anyone else? Thy word Praise the Lord. Is a lamp unto Is there anyone else? Feet Trust in the Father's game plan. You, you, you can't work for it. You, 
you can't you can't conjure it up all you can do is take in the light and and breathe in the breath and 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 stuff happens on the inside of you that that you cannot you can't beat that deal just take in light and just breathe and your life will be transformed. Nothing enough. will I fear as long as you are near. So everybody here, they're Please players, they're not spectators. Everyone here trusts in the Father's game plan. If you, if you haven't, I want you to come to the front and I'm gonna, we're going to pray for you. Oh, thy word is a is there one more? to my feet. And a light unto my path. Is there one? Thy word is a lamp unto Ten seconds. my feet. The game will be over. And a light no overtime. No, 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 no instant replay. Path. Jesus has already won the game. There's no need to look at it again. Jesus has already won. There's no need to go back. He's already won. Is is there one more? All right, well, we're going to pray. Father in heaven, this thing isn't about sports and, and all that stuff. That's just entertainment. This thing is about me living an authentic, intentional Christian life. They're millionaires. They don't even, they're personalities. They're celebrities. They got troubles of their own. But we, we don't live in, in the hills. We, we don't have millions. But, but we're like Paul. We're like Jesus. We're, we're trusting in your game plan. Father, there are people here under the sound of my voice that have responded to your offer. To not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, present our lives, our requests, our burdens to our coach. Father, I pray that the peace of God that transcends all understanding will keep our hearts and our minds through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, that is our prayer because that is your promise. And all who respond to the magnificent game plan of God respond by saying amen. God bless you. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path.